Section 25 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 25. Struck by a Bullet precipitate retreat of the confederates entrenchments at shiloh general buell general johnston remarks on shiloh during this second day of the battle i had been moving from right to left and back to see for myself the progress made in the early part of the afternoon while riding with colonel mcpherson and major hawkins then my chief commissary we got beyond the left of our troops we were moving along the northern edge of a clearing very leisurely toward the river above the landing there did not appear to be an enemy to our right until suddenly a battery with musketry opened upon us from the edge of the woods on the other side of the clearing the shells and balls whistled about our ears very fast for about a minute. I do not think it took us longer than that to get out of range and out of sight. In the sudden start we made, Major Hawkins lost his hat. He did not stop to pick it up. When we arrived at a perfectly safe position, we halted to take an account of damages. McPherson's horse was panting as if ready to drop. On examination, it was found that a ball had struck him forward of the flank, just back of the saddle, and had gone entirely through. In a few minutes, the poor beast dropped dead. He had given no sign of injury until we came to a stop. A ball had struck the metal scabbard of my sword, just below the hilt, and broken it nearly off. Before the battle was over, it had broken off entirely. There were three of us. One had lost a horse, killed, one a hat, and one a sword scabbard. All were thankful that it was no worse. After the rain of the night before, and the frequent and heavy rains for some days previous, the roads were almost impassable. The enemy, carrying his artillery and supply trains over them in his retreat, made them still worse for troops following. I wanted to pursue, but had not the heart to order the men, who had fought desperately for two days, lying in the mud and rain whenever not fighting, and I did not feel disposed to positively order Buell or any part of his command to pursue. Although the senior in rank at the time, I had been so only a few weeks. Buell was, and had been for some time past, a department commander, while I commanded only a district. I did not meet Buell in person until too late to get troops ready and pursue with effect. But, had I seen him at the moment of the last charge, I should have at least requested him to follow. I rode forward several miles the day after the battle, and found that the enemy had dropped much, if not all, of their provisions, some ammunition, and the extra wheels of their caissons, lightening their loads to enable them to get off their guns. About five miles out, we found their field hospital abandoned. An immediate pursuit must have resulted in the capture of a considerable number of prisoners and probably some guns. Shiloh was the severest battle fought at the West during the war, and but few in the East equaled it for hard, determined fighting. I saw an open field in our possession on the second day, over which the Confederates had made repeated charges the day before, so covered with dead that it would have been possible to walk across the clearing in any direction stepping on dead bodies without a foot touching the ground on our side 
national and confederate troops were mingled together in about equal proportions but on the remainder of the field nearly all were confederates on one part which had evidently not been ploughed for several years probably because the land was poor bushes had grown up some to the height of eight or ten feet there was not one of these left standing unpierced by bullets the smaller ones were all cut down contrary to all my experience up to that time and to the experience of the army i was then commanding we were on the defensive we were without entrenchments or defensive advantages of any sort and more than half the army engaged the first day was without experience or even drill as soldiers the officers with them except the division commanders and possibly two or three of the brigade commanders were equally inexperienced in war the result was a union victory that gave the men who achieved it great confidence in themselves ever after the enemy fought bravely but they had started out to defeat and destroy an army and capture a position they failed in both with very heavy loss in killed and wounded and must have gone back discouraged and convinced that the yankee was not an enemy to be despised after the battle I gave verbal instructions to division commanders to let the regiments send out parties to bury their own dead, and to detail parties, under commissioned officers from each division, to bury the Confederate dead in their respective fronts, and to report the numbers so buried. The latter part of these instructions was not carried out by all but they were by those sent from sherman's division and by some of the parties sent out by mcclernand the heaviest loss sustained by the enemy was in front of these two divisions the criticism has often been made that the union troops should have been entrenched at shiloh up to that time the pick and spade had been but little resorted to at the west i had however taken the subject under consideration soon after reassuming command in the field and as already stated my only military engineer reported unfavorably besides this the troops with me officers and men needed discipline and drill more than they did experience with the pick shovel and axe reinforcements were arriving almost daily composed of troops that had been hastily thrown together into companies and regiments, fragments of incomplete organizations, the men and officers strangers to each other. Under all these circumstances I concluded that drill and discipline were worth more to our men than fortifications. General Buell was a brave, intelligent officer, with as much professional pride and ambition of a commendable sort as I ever knew. I had been two years at West Point with him, and had served with him afterwards, in garrison and in the Mexican War, several years more. He was not given in early life or in mature years to forming intimate acquaintances. He was studious by habit, and commanded the confidence and respect of all who knew him he was a strict disciplinarian and perhaps did not distinguish sufficiently between the volunteer who enlisted for the war and the soldier who serves in time of peace one system embraced men who risked life for a principle and often men of social standing competence or wealth and independence of character the other includes as a rule only men who could not do as well in any other occupation general buell became an object of harsh criticism later some going so far as to challenge his loyalty no one who knew him ever believed him capable of a dishonorable act and nothing could be more dishonorable than to accept high rank and command in war 
and then betray the trust. When I came into command of the army in 1864, I requested the Secretary of War to restore General Buell to duty. After the war, during the summer of 1865, I traveled considerably through the north, and was everywhere met by large numbers of people. Every one had his opinion about the manner in which the war had been conducted, who among the generals had failed, how and why. Correspondents of the press were ever on hand to hear every word dropped, and were not always disposed to report correctly what did not confirm their preconceived notions either about the conduct of the war or the individuals concerned in it. The opportunity frequently occurred for me to defend General Buell against what I believed to be most unjust charges. On one occasion, a correspondence put in my mouth the very charge I had so often refuted of disloyalty. This brought from General Buell a very severe retort, which I saw in the New York world some time before I received the letter itself. I could very well understand his grievance at seeing untrue and disgraceful charges apparently sustained by an officer who, at the time, was at the head of the army. I replied to him, but not through the press. I kept no copy of my letter, nor did I ever see it in print, neither did I receive an answer. General Albert Sidney Johnston who commanded the Confederate forces at the beginning of the battle, was disabled by a wound on the afternoon of the first day. This wound, as I understood afterwards, was not necessarily fatal or even dangerous. But he was a man who would not abandon what he deemed an important trust in the face of danger, and consequently continued in the saddle, commanding, until so exhausted by the loss of blood that he had to be taken from his horse and soon after died. The news was not long in reaching our side, and I suppose was quite an encouragement to the national soldiers. I had known Johnston slightly in the Mexican War, and later as an officer in the regular army. He was a man of high character and ability, his contemporaries at West Point, and officers generally who came to know him personally later, and who remained on our side, expected him to prove the most formidable man to meet that the Confederacy would produce. I once wrote that nothing occurred in his brief command of an army to prove or disprove the high estimate that had been placed upon his military ability. But after studying the orders and dispatches of Johnston, I am compelled to materially modify my views of that officer's qualifications as a soldier. My judgment now is that he was vacillating and undecided in his actions. All the disasters in Kentucky and Tennessee were so discouraging to the authorities in Richmond that Jefferson Davis wrote an unofficial letter to Johnston expressing his own anxiety and that of the public, and saying that he had made such defense as was dictated by long friendship, but that in the absence of a report he needed facts. The letter was not a reprimand in direct terms, but it was evidently as much felt as though it had been one. General Johnston raised another army as rapidly as he could, and fortified or strongly entrenched at Corinth. He knew the national troops were preparing to attack him in his chosen position, but he had evidently become so disturbed at the results of his operations that he resolved to strike out in an offensive campaign which would restore all that was lost, and if successful, accomplish still more. We have the authority of his son and biographer for saying that his plan was to attack the forces at Shiloh and crush them, then to cross the Tennessee and destroy the army of Buell, and push the war across the Ohio River. 
The design was a bold one, but we have the same authority for saying that, in the execution, Johnston showed vacillation and indecision. He left Corinth on the 2nd of April, and was not ready to attack until the 6th. The distance his army had to march was less than 20 miles. Beauregard, his second in command, was opposed to the attack for two reasons. First, he thought if left alone, the national troops would attack the Confederates in their entrenchments. Second, we were in ground of our own choosing and would necessarily be entrenched. Johnston not only listened to the objection of Beauregard to an attack, but held a council of war on the subject on the morning of the 5th. On the evening of the same day, he was in consultation with some of his generals on the same subject, and still again on the morning of the 6th. During this last consultation, and before a decision had been reached, the battle began, by the national troops opening fire on the enemy. This seemed to settle the question as to whether there was to be any battle of Shiloh. It also seems to me to settle the question as to whether there was a surprise. I do not question the personal courage of General Johnston or his ability, but he did not win the distinction predicted for him by many of his friends he did prove that, as a general, he was overestimated. General Beauregard was next in rank to Johnston, and succeeded to the command, which he retained to the close of the battle and during the subsequent retreat on Corinth, as well as in the siege of that place. His tactics have been severely criticized by Confederate writers, but I do not believe his fallen chief could have done any better under the circumstances. Some of these critics claim that Shiloh was won when Johnston fell, and that if he had not fallen, the army under me would have been annihilated or captured. Ifs defeated the Confederates at Shiloh. There is little doubt that we would have been disgracefully beaten if all the shells and bullets fired by us had passed harmlessly over the enemy, and if all of theirs had taken effect. Commanding generals are liable to be killed during engagements, and the fact that when he was shot, Johnston was leading a brigade to induce it to make a charge which had been repeatedly ordered, is evidence that there was neither the universal demoralization on our side nor the unbounded confidence on theirs which has been claimed. There was, in fact, no hour during the day when I doubted the eventual defeat of the enemy, although I was disappointed that reinforcements so near at hand did not arrive at an earlier hour. The description of the Battle of Shiloh given by Colonel William Preston Johnston is very graphic and well told. The reader will imagine that he can see each blow struck, a demoralized and broken mob of Union soldiers, each blow sending the enemy more demoralized than ever towards the Tennessee River, which was a little more than two miles away at the beginning of the onset. If the reader does not stop to inquire why, with such Confederate successes for more than twelve hours of hard fighting, the national troops were not all killed, captured, or driven into the river, he will regard the pen picture as perfect. But I witnessed the fight from the national side from eight o'clock in the morning until night closed the contest. I see but little in the description that I can recognize. The Confederate troops fought well and deserve commendation enough for their bravery and endurance on the 6th of April without detracting from their antagonists or claiming anything more than their just dues. The reports of the enemy show that their condition at the end of the first day was deplorable. Their losses in killed and wounded had been very heavy, and their stragglers 
had been quite as numerous as on the national side with the difference that those of the enemy left the field entirely and were not brought back to their respective commands for many days on the union side but few of the stragglers fell back further than the landing on the river and many of these were in line for duty on the second day the admissions of the highest confederate officers engaged at shiloh make the claim of a victory for them absurd the victory was not to either party until the battle was over it was then a union victory in which the armies of the tennessee and the ohio both participated but the army of the tennessee fought the entire rebel army on the sixth and held it at bay until near night and night alone closed the conflict and not the three regiments of nelson's division the confederates fought with courage at shiloh but the particular skill claimed i could not and still cannot see though there is nothing to criticize except the claims put forward for it since but the confederate claimants for superiority in strategy superiority in generalship and superiority in dash and prowess are not so unjust to the union troops engaged at shiloh as are many northern writers the troops on both sides were american and united they need not fear any foreign foe it is possible that the southern man started in with a little more dash than his northern brother but he was correspondingly less enduring the endeavor of the enemy on the first day was simply to hurl their men against ours first at one point then at another sometimes at several points at once this they did with daring and energy until at night the rebel troops were worn out our effort during the same time was to be prepared to resist assaults wherever made the object of the confederates on the second day was to get away with as much of their army and material as possible ours then was to drive them from our front and to capture or destroy as great a part as possible of their men and material we were successful in driving them back but not so successful in captures as if further pursuit could have been made as it was we captured or recaptured on the second day about as much artillery as we lost on the first and leaving out the one great capture of prentice we took more prisoners on monday than the enemy gained from us on sunday on the sixth sherman lost seven pieces of artillery mcclernand six prentiss eight and hurlbut two batteries on the seventh sherman captured seven guns mcclernand three and the army of the ohio twenty at shiloh the effective strength of the union forces on the morning of the sixth was thirty three thousand men lew wallace brought five thousand more after nightfall beauregard reported the enemy's strength at forty thousand nine hundred and fifty five according to the custom of enumeration in the south this number probably excluded every man enlisted as musician or detailed as guard or nurse and all commissioned officers everybody who did not carry a musket or serve a cannon with us everybody in the field receiving pay from the government is counted excluding the troops who fled panic-stricken before they had fired a shot there was not a time during the sixth when we had more than twenty five thousand men in line on the seventh buell brought twenty thousand more of his remaining two divisions thomas's did not reach the field during the engagement woods arrived before firing had ceased but not in time to be of much service our loss in the two days fight was one thousand seven hundred fifty four killed eight thousand four hundred eight wounded and two thousand eight hundred eighty five missing of these 
2,103 were in the Army of the Ohio. Beauregard reported a total loss of 10,699, of whom 1,728 were killed, 8,012 wounded, and 957 missing. This estimate must be incorrect. We buried, by actual count, more of the enemy's dead in front of the divisions of McClernand and Sherman alone than here reported, and 4,000 was the estimate of the burial parties of the whole field. Beauregard reports the Confederate force on the 6th at over 40,000, and their total loss during the two days at 10,699, and at the same time declares that he could put only 20,000 men in battle on the morning of the 7th. The Navy gave a hearty support to the Army at Shiloh, as indeed it always did both before and subsequently when I was in command. The nature of the ground was such, however, that on this occasion it could do nothing in aid of the troops until sundown on the first day. The country was broken and heavily timbered, cutting off all view of the battle from the river, so that friends would be as much in danger from fire from the gunboats as the foe. But about sundown, when the national troops were back in their last position, the right of the enemy was near the river and exposed to the fire of the two gunboats, which was delivered with vigor and effect. After nightfall, when firing had entirely ceased on land, the commander of the fleet informed himself, approximately, of the position of our troops and suggested the idea of dropping a shell within the lines of the enemy every fifteen minutes during the night. This was done with effect, as is proved by the Confederate reports. Up to the Battle of Shiloh, I as well as thousands of other citizens believed that the rebellion against the government would collapse suddenly and soon if a decisive victory could be gained over any of its armies. Donaldson and Henry were such victories. An army of more than 21,000 men was captured or destroyed. Bowling Green, Columbus, and Hickman, Kentucky, fell in consequence in Clarksville and Nashville, Tennessee, the last two with an immense amount of stores also fell into our hands. The Tennessee and Cumberland rivers from their mouths to the head of navigation were secured. But when Confederate armies were collected, which not only attempted to hold a line further south, from Memphis to Chattanooga, Knoxville, and on to the Atlantic, but assumed the offensive and made such a gallant effort to regain what had been lost, then, indeed, I gave up all idea of saving the Union except by complete conquest. Up to that time it had been the policy of our army, certainly of that portion commanded by me, to protect the property of the citizens whose territory was invaded without regard to their sentiments, whether Union or secession. After this, however, I regarded it as humane to both sides to protect the persons of those found at their homes, but to consume everything that could be used to support or supply armies. Protection was still continued over such supplies as were within lines held by us and which we expected to continue to hold but such supplies within the reach of Confederate armies I regarded as much contraband as arms or ordnance stores. Their destruction was accomplished without bloodshed, intended to the same result as the destruction of armies. I continued this policy to the close of the war. Promiscuous pillage, however, was discouraged and punished. Instructions were always given to take provisions and forage under the direction of commissioned officers who should give receipts to owners if at home, and turn the property over to officers of the quartermaster or commissary departments to
to be issued as if furnished from our northern depots. But much was destroyed without receipts to owners when it could not be brought within our lines and would otherwise have gone to the support of secession and rebellion. This policy, I believe, exercised a material influence in hastening the end. The Battle of Shiloh, or Pittsburg Landing, has been perhaps less understood, or, to state the case more accurately, more persistently misunderstood, than any other engagement between national and confederate troops during the entire rebellion. Correct reports of the battle have been published, notably by Sherman, Badeau, and in a speech before a meeting of veterans by General Prentiss but all of these appeared long subsequent to the close of the rebellion and after public opinion had been most erroneously formed. I myself made no report to General Halleck further than was contained in a letter written immediately after the battle informing him that an engagement had been fought and announcing the result. A few days afterwards, General Halleck moved his headquarters to Pittsburgh Landing and assumed command of the troops in the field. Although next to him in rank, and nominally in command of my old district and army, I was ignored as much as if I had been at the most distant point of territory within my jurisdiction, and although I was in command of all the troops engaged at Shiloh, I was not permitted to see one of the reports of General Buell or his subordinates in that battle until they were published by the War Department long after the event. For this reason, I never made a full official report of this engagement. End of section 25. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 26. Halleck Assumes Command in the Field. THE ADVANCE UPON CORINTH, OCCUPATION OF CORINTH, THE ARMY SEPARATED. GENERAL HALLECK ARRIVED AT PITTSBURGH LANDING ON THE 11TH OF APRIL, AND IMMEDIATELY ASSUMED COMMAND IN THE FIELD. ON THE 21ST, GENERAL POPE ARRIVED WITH AN ARMY OF 30,000 STRONG, FRESH FROM THE CAPTURE OF ISLAND No. 10 IN THE MISSISSIPPI RIVER. He went into camp at Hamburg Landing, five miles above Pittsburgh. Halleck had now three armies, the Army of the Ohio, Buell commanding, the Army of the Mississippi, Pope commanding, and the Army of the Tennessee. His orders divided the combined force into the right wing, reserve, center, and left wing. Major General George H. Thomas, who had been in Buell's army, was transferred with his division to the Army of the Tennessee and given command of the right wing, composed of all of that army except McClernand's and Lew Wallace's divisions. McClernand was assigned to the command of the reserve, composed of his own and Lew Wallace's divisions. Buell commanded the center, the Army of the Ohio, and Pope the left wing the Army of the Mississippi. I was named second in command of the whole, and was also supposed to be in command of the right wing and reserve. Orders were given to all the commanders engaged at Shiloh to send in their reports without delay to department headquarters. Those from officers of the Army of the Tennessee were sent through me, but from the Army of the Ohio they were sent by General Buell without passing through my hands. 
General Halleck ordered me, verbally, to send in my report, but I positively declined on the ground that he had received the reports of a part of the army engaged at Shiloh without their coming through me. He admitted that my refusal was justifiable under the circumstances, but explained that he had wanted to get the reports off before moving the command, and as fast as a report had come to him, he had forwarded it to Washington. Preparations were at once made upon the arrival of the new commander for an advance on Corinth. Owl Creek, on our right, was bridged, and expeditions were sent to the northwest and west to ascertain if our position was being threatened from those quarters. The roads towards Corinth were corduroyed and new ones made. Lateral roads were also constructed so that in case of necessity troops marching by different routes could reinforce each other. All commanders were cautioned against bringing on an engagement and informed in so many words that it would be better to retreat than to fight. By the 30th of April all preparations were complete. The country west to the Mobile and Ohio Railroad had been reconnoitered, as well as the road to Corinth as far as Monterey, twelve miles from Pittsburgh. Everywhere small bodies of the enemy had been encountered, but they were observers and not in force to fight battles. Corinth, Mississippi, lies in a southwesterly direction from Pittsburgh Landing, and about nineteen miles away as the bird would fly, but probably twenty-two by the nearest wagon road. It is about four miles south of the line, dividing the states of Tennessee and Mississippi, and at the junction of the Mississippi and Chattanooga Railroad with the Mobile and Ohio Road, which runs from Columbus to Mobile. From Pittsburgh to Corinth, the land is rolling, but at no point reaching an elevation that makes high hills to pass over. In 1862, the greater part of the country was covered with forest, with intervening clearings and houses. Underbrush was dense in the low grounds, along the creeks and ravines, but generally not so thick on the high land as to prevent men passing through with ease. There are two small creeks running from north of the town and connecting some four miles south where they form Bridge Creek, which empties into the Tuscumbia River. Corinth is on the ridge between these streams and is a naturally strong defensive position. The creeks are insignificant in volume of water, but the stream to the east widens out in front of the town into a swamp impassable in the presence of an enemy. On the crest of the west bank of this stream, the enemy was strongly entrenched. Corinth was a valuable strategic point for the enemy to hold, and consequently a valuable one for us to possess ourselves of. We ought to have seized it immediately after the fall of Donelson and Nashville, when it could have been taken without a battle, but failing then, it should have been taken without delay on the concentration of troops at Pittsburgh Landing after the Battle of Shiloh. In fact, the arrival of Pope should not have been awaited. There was no time from the Battle of Shiloh up to the evacuation of Corinth when the enemy would not have left if pushed. The demoralization among the Confederates from their defeats at Henry and Donelson, their long marches from Bowling Green, Columbus, and Nashville, and their failure at Shiloh, in fact, from having been driven out of Kentucky and Tennessee, was so great that a stand for the time would have been impossible. Beauregard made strenuous efforts to reinforce himself and partially succeeded. He appealed to the people of the Southwest for new regiments, and received a few. A. S. Johnston had made efforts to reinforce in the same quarter, before the Battle of Shiloh, but in a different way. 
he had negroes sent out to him to take the place of teamsters company cooks and laborers in every capacity so as to put all his white men into the ranks the people while willing to send their sons to the field were not willing to part with their negroes it is only fair to state that they probably wanted their blacks to raise supplies for the army and for the families left at home beauregard however was reinforced by van dorn immediately after shiloh with seventeen thousand men interior points less exposed were also depleted to add to the strength at corinth with these reinforcements and the new regiments beauregard had during the month of may eighteen sixty two a large force on paper but probably not much over fifty thousand effective men we estimated his strength at seventy thousand our own was in round numbers one hundred and twenty thousand the defensible nature of the ground at corinth and the fortifications made fifty thousand then enough to maintain their position against double that number for an indefinite time but for the demoralization spoken of on the thirtieth of april the grand army commenced its advance from shiloh upon corinth the movement was a siege from the start to the close the national troops were always behind entrenchments except of course the small reconnoitering parties sent to the front to clear the way for an advance even the commanders of these parties were cautioned not to bring on an engagement it is better to retreat than to fight the enemy were constantly watching our advance but as they were simply observers there were but few engagements that even threatened to become battles all the engagements fought ought to have served to encourage the enemy roads were again made in our front and again corduroyed a line was entrenched and the troops were advanced to the new position crossroads were constructed to these new positions to enable the troops to concentrate in case of attack the national armies were thoroughly entrenched all the way from the tennessee river to corinth for myself i was little more than an observer orders were sent direct to the right wing or reserve ignoring me and advances were made from one line of entrenchments to another without notifying me my position was so embarrassing in fact that i made several applications during the siege to be relieved general halleck kept his headquarters generally if not all the time with the right wing pope being on the extreme left did not see so much of his chief and consequently got loose as it were at times on the third of may he was at seven mile creek with the main body of his command but threw forward a division to farmington within four miles of corinth his troops had quite a little engagement at farmington on that day but carried the place with considerable loss to the enemy there would then have been no difficulty in advancing the centre and right so as to form a new line well up to the enemy but pope was ordered back to conform with the general line on the eighth of may he moved again taking his whole force to farmington and pushed out two divisions close to the rebel line again he was ordered back by the fourth of may the centre and right wing reached monterey twelve miles out their advance was slow from there for they entrenched with every forward movement the left wing moved up again on the twenty fifth of may and entrenched itself close to the enemy the creek with the marsh before described separated the two lines skirmishers thirty feet apart could have maintained either line at this point our centre and right were at this time extended so that the right of the right wing was probably five miles from corinth and four from the works in their front the creek 
which was a formidable obstacle for either side to pass on our left, became a very slight obstacle on our right. Here the enemy occupied two positions. One of them, as much as two miles out from the main line, was on a commanding elevation and defended by an entrenched battery with infantry supports. A heavy wood intervened between this work and the national forces. In rear of the south, there was a clearing extending a mile or more, and south of this clearing a log house which had been loopholed and was occupied by infantry. Sherman's division carried these two positions with some loss to himself, but with probably greater to the enemy, on the 28th of May, and on that day the investment of Corinth was complete, or as complete as it was ever made. Thomas's right now rested west of the Mobile and Ohio Railroad. Pope's left commanded the Memphis and Charleston Railroad east of Corinth. Some days before, I had suggested to the commanding general that I thought if he would move the Army of the Mississippi at night, by the rear of the center and right, ready to advance at daylight, Pope would find no natural obstacle in his front and, I believe, no serious artificial one. The ground or works occupied by our left could be held by a thin picket line owing to the stream and swamp in front to the right the troops would have a dry ridge to march over i was silent so quickly that i felt that possibly i had suggested an unmilitary movement later probably on the twenty eighth of may general logan whose command was then on the mobile and ohio railroad said to me that the enemy had been evacuating for several days, and that if allowed he could go into Corinth with his brigade. Trains of cars were heard coming in and going out of Corinth constantly. Some of the men, who had been engaged in various capacities on railroads before the war, claimed that they could tell, by putting their ears to the rail, not only which way the trains were moving, but which trains were loaded and which were empty. They said loaded trains had been going out for several days and empty ones coming in. Subsequent events proved the correctness of their judgment. Beauregard published his orders for the evacuation of Corinth on the 26th of May and fixed the 29th for the departure of his troops. And on the 30th of May, General Halleck had his whole army drawn up, prepared for battle, and announced in orders that there was every indication that our left was to be attacked that morning. Corinth had already been evacuated, and the national troops marched on and took possession without opposition. Everything had been destroyed or carried away. The Confederate commander had instructed his soldiers to cheer on the arrival of every train to create the impression among the Yankees that reinforcements were arriving. There was not a sick or wounded man left by the Confederates, nor stores of any kind. Some ammunition had been blown up, not removed. But the trophies of war were a few Quaker guns, logs of about the diameter of ordinary cannon, mounted on wheels of wagons and pointed in the most threatening manner towards us. The possession of Corinth by the national troops was of strategic importance, but the victory was barren in every other particular. It was nearly bloodless. It is a question whether the morale of the Confederate troops engaged at Corinth was not improved by the immunity with which they were permitted to remove all public property and then withdraw themselves. On our side, I know officers and men of the Army of the Tennessee, and I presume the same is true of those of the other commands, were disappointed at the result. They could not see how the mere occupation of places 
was to close the war while large and effective rebel armies existed. They believed that a well-directed attack would at least have partially destroyed the army defending Corinth. For myself, I am satisfied that Corinth could have been captured in a two days campaign, commenced promptly on the arrival of reinforcements after the Battle of Shiloh. General Halleck at once commenced erecting fortifications around Corinth on a scale to indicate that this one point must be held if it took the whole national army to do it. All commanding points, two or three miles to the south, southeast, and southwest, were strongly fortified. It was expected, in case of necessity, to connect these forts by rifle pits. They were laid out on a scale that would have required 100,000 men to fully man them. It was probably thought that a final battle of the war would be fought at that point. These fortifications were never used. Immediately after the occupation of Corinth by the national troops, General Pope was sent in pursuit of the retreating garrison, and General Buell soon followed. Buell was the senior of the two generals and commanded the entire column. The pursuit was kept up for some thirty miles, but did not result in the capture of any material of war or prisoners unless a few stragglers who had fallen behind and were willing captives. On the 10th of June, the pursuing column was all back at Corinth. The Army of the Tennessee was not engaged in any of these movements. The Confederates were now driven out of West Tennessee, and on the 6th of June, after a well-contested naval battle, the National forces took possession of Memphis and held the Mississippi River from its source to that point. The railroad from Columbus to Corinth was at once put in good condition and held by us. We had garrisons at Donelson, Clarksville, and Nashville on the Cumberland River, and held the Tennessee River from its mouth to Eastport. New Orleans and Baton Rouge had fallen into the possession of the national forces, so that now the Confederates at the West, were narrowed down for all communication with Richmond to the single line of road running east from Vicksburg. To dispossess them of this, therefore, became a matter of the first importance. The possession of the Mississippi by us from Memphis to Baton Rouge was also a most important object. It would be equal to the amputation of a limb in its weakening effects upon the enemy. After the capture of Corinth, a movable force of 80,000 men, besides enough to hold all the territory acquired, could have been set in motion for the accomplishment of any great campaign for the suppression of the rebellion. In addition to this, fresh troops were being raised to swell the effective force. But the work of depletion commenced. Buell, with the Army of the Ohio, was sent east, following the line of the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. This he was ordered to repair as he advanced, only to have it destroyed by small guerrilla bands or other troops as soon as he was out of the way. If he had been sent directly to Chattanooga, as rapidly as he could march, leaving two or three divisions along the line of the railroad from Nashville forward, he could have arrived with but little fighting, and would have saved much of the loss of life which was afterwards incurred in gaining Chattanooga. Bragg would then not have had time to raise an army to contest the possession of Middle and East Tennessee and Kentucky, the battles of Stone River and Chickamauga would not necessarily have been fought. Burnside would not have been besieged in Knoxville without the power of helping himself or escaping. The battle of Chattanooga would not have been fought. These are the negative advantages, if the term negative is applicable, which would probably have resulted from prompt movements 
after Corinth fell into the possession of the national forces. The positive results might have been a bloodless advance to Atlanta, to Vicksburg, or to any other desired point south of Corinth in the interior of Mississippi. End of section 26 Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Twenty-seven of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 27. Headquarters moved to Memphis. On the road to Memphis. Escaping Jackson. Complaints and requests. Halleck appointed commander-in-chief, return to Corinth, movements of Bragg, surrender of Clarksville, the advance upon Chattanooga, Sheridan, colonel of a Michigan regiment. My position at Corinth, with a nominal command, and yet no command, became so unbearable that I asked permission of Halleck to remove my headquarters to Memphis. I had repeatedly asked, between the fall of Donelson and the evacuation of Corinth, to be relieved from duty under Halleck, but all my applications were refused until the occupation of the town. I then obtained permission to leave the department, but General Sherman happened to call on me as I was about starting, and urged me so strongly not to think of going that I concluded to remain. My application to be permitted to remove my headquarters to Memphis was, however, approved, and on the 21st of June I started for that point with my staff and a cavalry escort of only a part of one company. There was a detachment of two or three companies going some twenty-five miles west, to be stationed as a guard to the railroad. I went under cover of this escort to the end of their march, and the next morning proceeded to LaGrange with no convoy but the few cavalry men I had with me. From LaGrange to Memphis the distance is forty-seven miles. There were no troops stationed between these two points except a small force guarding a working party which was engaged in repairing the railroad. Not knowing where this party would be found, I halted at LaGrange. General Herbert was in command there at the time, and had his headquarters tents pitched on the lawn of a very commodious country house. The proprietor was at home, and, learning of my arrival, he invited General Herbert and me to dine with him. I accepted the invitation, and spent a very pleasant afternoon with my host, who was a thorough southern gentleman, fully convinced of the justice of secession. After dinner, seated in the capacious porch, he entertained me with a recital of the services he was rendering the cause. He was too old to be in the ranks himself, he must have been quite seventy then, but his means enabled him to be useful in other ways. In ordinary times the homestead where he was now living produced the bread and meat to supply the slaves of his main plantation in the lowlands of Mississippi. Now he raised food and forage on both places, and thought he would have that year a surplus sufficient to feed three hundred families of poor men who had gone into the war and left their families dependent upon the patriotism of those better off. The crops around me looked fine, and I had at the moment an idea that about the time they were ready to be gathered the Yankee troops 
would be in the neighborhood and harvest them for the benefit of those engaged in the suppression of the rebellion instead of its support i felt however the greatest respect for the candor of my host and for his zeal in the cause he thoroughly believed in though our views were as wide apart as it is possible to conceive the twenty third of june eighteen sixty two on the road from lagrange to memphis was very warm even for that latitude and season with my staff and small escort i started at an early hour and before noon we arrived within twenty miles of memphis at this point i saw a very comfortable-looking white-haired gentleman seated at the front of his house a little distance from the road i let my staff and escort ride ahead while i halted and for an excuse asked for a glass of water i was invited at once to dismount and come in i found my host very genial and communicative and stayed longer than i had intended until the lady of the house announced dinner and asked me to join them the host however was not pressing so that i declined the invitation and mounting my horse rode on about a mile west from where i had been stopping a road comes up from the southeast joining that from lagrange to memphis a mile west of this junction i found my staff and escort halted and enjoying the shade of forest trees on the lawn of a house located several hundred feet back from the road their horses hitched to the fence along the line of the road i too stopped and we remained there until the cool of the afternoon and then rode into memphis the gentleman with whom i had stopped twenty miles from memphis was a mr deloche a man loyal to the union he had not pressed me to tarry longer with him because in the early part of my visit a neighbor a dr smith had called and on being presented to me backed off the porch as if something had hit him mr delouche knew that the rebel general jackson was in that neighborhood with a detachment of cavalry his neighbor was as earnest in the southern cause as was mr delouche in that of the union the exact location of jackson was entirely unknown to mr delouche but he was sure that his neighbor would know it and would give information of my presence and this made my stay unpleasant to him after the call of dr smith i have stated that a detachment of troops was engaged in guarding workmen who were repairing the railroad east of memphis on the day i entered memphis jackson captured a small herd of beef cattle which had been sent east for the troops so engaged the drovers were not enlisted men and he released them a day or two after one of these drovers came to my headquarters and relating the circumstances of his capture said jackson was very much disappointed that he had not captured me that he was six or seven miles south of the memphis and charleston railroad when he learned that i was stopping at the house of mr delouche and had ridden with his command to the junction of the road he was on with that from lagrange and memphis where he learned that i had passed three quarters of an hour before he thought it would be useless to pursue with jaded horses a well-mounted party with so much of a start had he gone three quarters of a mile further he would have found me with my party quietly resting under the shade of trees and without even arms in our hands with which to defend ourselves general jackson of course did not communicate his disappointment at not capturing me to a prisoner a young drover but from the talk among the soldiers the facts related were learned a day or two later mr delouche called on me in memphis to apologize for his apparent incivility in not insisting on my staying for dinner he said that his wife accused him of marked discourtesy but that after the call of his neighbor he had felt restless until i got away i never met general jackson before the war nor during it but have met him since at his very comfortable summer home at manitou springs colorado 
I reminded him of the above incident, and this drew from him the response that he was thankful now he had not captured me. I certainly was very thankful, too. My occupation of Memphis as district headquarters did not last long. The period, however, was marked by a few incidents which were novel to me. Up to that time I had not occupied any place in the South where the citizens were at home in any great numbers. Dover was within the fortifications at Fort Donelson, and, as far as I remember, every citizen was gone. There were no people living at Pittsburgh Landing, and but very few at Corinth. Memphis, however, was a populous city, and there were many of the citizens remaining there who were not only thoroughly impressed with the justice of their cause, but who thought that even the Yankee soldiery must entertain the same views if they could only be induced to make an honest confession. It took hours of my time every day to listen to complaints and requests. The latter were generally reasonable, and if so, they were granted. But the complaints were not always or even often well founded. Two instances will mark the general character. First, the officer who commanded at Memphis immediately after the city fell into the hands of the national troops had ordered one of the churches of the city to be open to the soldiers. Army chaplains were authorized to occupy the pulpit. Second, at the beginning of the war, the Confederate Congress had passed a law confiscating all property of alien enemies at the South, including the debts of Southerners to Northern men. In consequence of this law, when Memphis was occupied, the provost marshal had forcibly collected all the evidence he could obtain of such debts. Almost the first complaints made to me were these two outrages. The gentleman who made the complaints informed me first of his own high standing as a lawyer, a citizen, and a Christian. He was a deacon in the church which had been defiled by the occupation of Union troops and by a Union chaplain filling the pulpit. He did not use the word defile, but he expressed the idea very clearly. He asked that the church be restored to the former congregation, I told him that no order had been issued prohibiting the congregation attending the church. He said of course the congregation could not hear a northern clergyman who differed so radically with them on questions of government. I told him the troops would continue to occupy that church for the present, and that they would not be called upon to hear disloyal sentiments proclaimed from the pulpit. This closed the argument on the first point. Then came the second. The complainant said he wanted the papers restored to him which had been surrendered to the provost marshal under protest. He was a lawyer, and before the establishment of the Confederate States government, had been the attorney for a number of large business houses at the North, that his government had confiscated all debts due alien enemies, and appointed commissioners or officers to collect such debts and pay them over to the government, but in his case, owing to his high standing, he had been permitted to hold these claims for collection, the responsible officials knowing that he would account to the government for every dollar received. He said that his government, when it came in possession of all its territory, would hold him personally responsible for the claims he had surrendered to the provost marshal. His impudence was so sublime that I was rather amused than indignant. I told him, however, that if he would remain in Memphis, I did not believe the Confederate government would ever molest him. He left, no doubt, as much amazed at my assurance as I was at the brazenness of his request. On the 11th of July, General Halleck received telegraphic orders appointing him to the command of all the armies, with headquarters in Washington. His instructions 
pressed him to proceed to his new field of duty with as little delay as was consistent with the safety and interest of his previous command. I was next in rank, and he telegraphed me the same day to report at department headquarters at Corinth. I was not informed by the dispatch that my chief had been ordered to a different field, and did not know whether to move my headquarters or not. I telegraphed, asking if I was to take my staff with me, and received word in reply, This place will be your headquarters. You can judge for yourself. I left Memphis for my new field without delay, and reached Corinth on the 15th of the month. General Halleck remained until the 17th of July, but he was very uncommunicative, and gave me no information as to what I had been called to Corinth for. When General Halleck left to assume the duties of General-in-Chief, I remained in command of the District of West Tennessee. Practically, I became a department commander, because no one was assigned to that position over me, and I made my reports direct to the General-in-Chief. But I was not assigned to the position of Department Commander until the 25th of October. General Halleck, while commanding the Department of the Mississippi, had had control as far east as a line drawn from Chattanooga north. My district only embraced West Tennessee and Kentucky west of the Cumberland River. Buell, with the Army of the Ohio, had, as previously stated, been ordered east towards Chattanooga, with instructions to repair the Memphis and Charleston Railroad as he advanced. Troops had been sent north by Halleck along the line of the Mobile and Ohio Railroad to put it in repair as far as Columbus. Other troops were stationed on the railroad from Jackson, Tennessee, to Grand Junction, and still others on the road west to Memphis. The remainder of the magnificent army of 120,000 men, which entered Corinth on the 30th of May, had now become so scattered that I was put entirely on the defensive in a territory whose population was hostile to the Union. One of the first things I had to do was to construct fortifications at Corinth better suited to the garrison that could be spared to man them. The structures that had been built during the months of May and June were left as monuments to the skill of the engineer, and others were constructed in a few days, plainer in design, but suited to the command available to defend them. I disposed the troops belonging to the district in conformity with the situation as rapidly as possible. The forces at Donelson, Clarksville, and Nashville, with those at Corinth and along the railroad eastward, I regarded as sufficient for protection against any attack from the west. The Mobile and Ohio Railroad was guarded from Rienzi south of Corinth to Columbus and the Mississippi Central Railroad from Jackson, Tennessee, to Bolivar. Grand Junction and LaGrange on the Memphis Railroad were abandoned. South of the Army of the Tennessee and confronting it was Van Dorn, with a sufficient force to organize a movable army of thirty-five to 40,000 men, after being reinforced by Price from Missouri. This movable force could be thrown against either Corinth, Bolivar or Memphis, and the best that could be done in such event would be to weaken the points not threatened in order to reinforce the one that was. Nothing could be gained on the national side by attacking elsewhere because the territory already occupied was as much as the force present could guard. The most anxious period of the war, to me, was during the time the Army of the Tennessee was guarding the territory acquired by the fall of Corinth and Memphis, and before I was sufficiently reinforced to take the offensive. The enemy also had cavalry operating in our rear, making it necessary to guard every point of the railroad back to Columbus, on the security of which we were dependent for all our supplies. 
headquarters were connected by telegraph with all points of the command except memphis and the mississippi below columbus with these points communication was had by the railroad to columbus then down the river by boat to reinforce memphis would take three or four days and to get an order there for troops to move elsewhere would have taken at least two days memphis therefore was practically isolated from the balance of the command but it was in sherman's hands then too the troops were well entrenched and the gunboats made a valuable auxiliary during the two months after the departure of general halleck there was much fighting between small bodies of the contending armies but these encounters were dwarfed by the magnitude of the main battle so as to be now almost forgotten except by those engaged in them some of them however estimated by the losses on both sides in killed and wounded were equal in hard fighting to most of the battles of the mexican war which attracted so much of the attention of the public when they occurred about the twenty third of july colonel ross commanding at bolivar was threatened by a large force of the enemy so that he had to be reinforced from jackson and corinth on the twenty seventh there was skirmishing on the hatchie river eight miles from bolivar on the thirtieth i learned from colonel p h sheridan who had been far to the south that bragg in person was at rome georgia with his troops moving by rail by way of mobile to chattanooga and his wagon train marching overland to join him at rome price was at this time at holly springs mississippi with a large force and occupied grand junction as an outpost i proposed to the general-in-chief to be permitted to drive him away but was informed that while i had to judge for myself the best use to make of my troops was not to scatter them but hold them ready to reinforce buell the movement of bragg himself with his wagon trains to chattanooga across country while his troops were transported over a long roundabout road to the same destination without need of guards except when in my immediate front demonstrates the advantage which troops enjoy while acting in a country where the people are friendly buell was marching through a hostile region and had to have his communications thoroughly guarded back to a base of supplies more men were required the further the national troops penetrated into the enemy's country i with an army sufficiently powerful to have destroyed bragg was purely on the defensive and accomplishing no more than to hold a force far inferior to my own on the second of august i was ordered from washington to live upon the country on the resources of citizens hostile to the government so far as practicable i was also directed to handle rebels within our lines without gloves to imprison them or to expel them from their homes and from our lines i do not recollect having arrested and confined a citizen not a soldier during the entire rebellion i am aware that a great many were sent to northern prisons particularly to joliet illinois by some of my subordinates with the statement that it was my order i had all such released the moment i learned of their arrest and finally sent a staff officer north to release every prisoner who was said to be confined by my order there were many citizens at home who deserved punishment because they were soldiers when an opportunity was afforded to inflict an injury to the national cause this class was not the kind that were apt to get arrested and i deemed it better that a few guilty men should escape than that a great many innocent ones should suffer on the fourteenth of august i was ordered to send two more divisions to buell they were sent the same day by way of decatur on the twenty-second colonel rodney mason surrendered clarksville with six companies of his regiment
Colonel Mason was one of the officers who had led their regiments off the field at almost the first fire of the rebels at Shiloh. He was by nature and education a gentleman, and was terribly mortified at his action when the battle was over. He came to me with tears in his eyes and begged to be allowed to have another trial. I felt great sympathy for him and sent him with his regiment to garrison Clarksville and Donaldson. He selected Clarksville for his headquarters, no doubt because he regarded it as the post of danger, it being nearer the enemy. But when he was summoned to surrender by a band of guerrillas, his constitutional weakness overcame him. He inquired the number of men the enemy had, and receiving a response indicating a force greater than his own, he said if he could be satisfied of that fact he would surrender. Arrangements were made for him to count the guerrillas, and having satisfied himself that the enemy had the greater force, he surrendered and informed his subordinate at Donaldson of the fact advising him to do the same. The guerrillas paroled their prisoners and moved upon Donaldson, but the officer in command at that point marched out to meet them and drove them away. Among other embarrassments at the time of which I now write was the fact that the government wanted to get out all the cotton possible from the South and directed me to give every facility toward that end. Pay in gold was authorized, and stations on the Mississippi River and on the railroad in our possession had to be designated where cotton would be received. This opened to the enemy not only the means of converting cotton into money, which had a value all over the world, and which they so much needed, but it afforded them means of obtaining accurate and intelligent information in regard to our position and strength it was also demoralizing to the troops citizens obtaining permits from the treasury department had to be protected within our lines and given facilities to get out cotton by which they realized enormous profits men who had enlisted to fight the battles of their country did not like to be engaged in protecting a traffic which went to the support of an enemy they had to fight, and the profits of which went to men who shared none of their dangers. On the 30th of August, Colonel M. D. Leggett, near Bolivar, with the 20th and 29th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, was attacked by a force supposed to be about 4,000 strong. The enemy was driven away with a loss of more than 100 men, on the 1st of September, the bridge guard at Medden was attacked by guerrillas. The guard held the position until reinforced when the enemy were routed, leaving about 50 of their number on the field dead or wounded, our loss being only two killed and 15 wounded. On the same day, Colonel Dennis, with a force of less than 500 infantry and two pieces of artillery, met the cavalry of the enemy in strong force a few miles west of Medden, and drove them away with great loss. Our troops buried a 179 of the enemy's dead left upon the field. Afterwards it was found that all the houses in the vicinity of the battlefield were turned into hospitals for the wounded. Our loss, as reported at the time, was 45 killed and wounded. On the 2nd of September, I was ordered to send more reinforcements to Buell. Jackson and Bolivar were yet threatened, but I sent the reinforcements. On the 4th, I received direct orders to send Granger's division also to Louisville, Kentucky. General Buell had left Corinth about the 10th of June to march upon Chattanooga. Bragg, who had superseded Beauregard in command, sent one division from Tupelo on the 27th of June for the same place. This gave Buell about 17 days' start. If he had not been required to repair the railroad as he advanced, the march 
would have been made in eighteen days at the outside and chattanooga must have been reached by the national forces before the rebels could have possibly got there the road between nashville and chattanooga could easily have been put in repair by other troops so that communication with the north would have been opened in a short time after the occupation of the place by the national troops if buell had been permitted to move in the first instance with the whole of the army of the ohio and that portion of the army of the mississippi afterwards sent to him he could have thrown four divisions from his own command along the line of road to repair and guard it granger's division was promptly sent on the fourth of september i was at the station at corinth when the troops reached that point and found general p h sheridan with them i expressed surprise at seeing him and said that i had not expected him to go he showed decided disappointment at the prospect of being detained i felt a little nettled at his desire to get away and did not detain him sheridan was a first lieutenant in the regiment in which i had served eleven years the fourth infantry and stationed on the pacific coast when the war broke out he was promoted to a captaincy in may eighteen sixty one and before the close of the year managed in some way i do not know how to get east he went to missouri halleck had known him as a very successful young officer in managing campaigns against the indians on the pacific coast and appointed him acting quartermaster in southwest missouri there was no difficulty in getting supplies forward while sheridan served in that capacity but he got into difficulty with his immediate superiors because of his stringent rules for preventing the use of public transportation for private purposes he asked to be relieved from further duty in the capacity in which he was engaged and his request was granted when general halleck took the field in april eighteen sixty two sheridan was assigned to duty on his staff during the advance on corinth a vacancy occurred in the colonelcy of the second michigan cavalry governor blair of michigan telegraphed general halleck asking him to suggest the name of a professional soldier for the vacancy saying he would appoint a good man without reference to his state sheridan was named and was so conspicuously efficient that when corinth was reached he was assigned to command a cavalry brigade in the army of the mississippi he was in command at boonville on the first of july with two small regiments when he was attacked by a force full three times as numerous as his own by very skilful maneuvers and boldness of attack he completely routed the enemy for this he was made a brigadier general and became a conspicuous figure in the army about corinth on this account i was sorry to see him leaving me his departure was probably fortunate for he rendered distinguished services in his new field granger and sheridan reached louisville before buell got there and on the night of their arrival sheridan with his command threw up works around the railroad station for the defense of troops as they came from the front end of section twenty seven recording by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim clevenger personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter twenty eight advance of van dorn and price Price enters Iuka, Battle of Iuka. At this time, September 4th, I had two divisions of the Army of the Mississippi stationed at Corinth, Rienzi, Jacinto, 
and Danville. There were at Corinth also Davies's division and two brigades of MacArthur's besides cavalry and artillery. This force constituted my left wing, of which Rosecrans was in command. General Ord commanded the center from Bethel to Humboldt on the Mobile and Ohio Railroad, and from Jackson to Bolivar, where the Mississippi Central is crossed by the Hatchie River. General Sherman commanded on the right at Memphis, with two of his brigades back at Brownsville, at the crossing of the Hatchie River by the Memphis and Ohio Railroad. This made the most convenient arrangement I could devise for concentrating all my spare forces upon any threatened point. All the troops of the command were within telegraphic communication with each other, except those under Sherman. By bringing a portion of his command to Brownsville, from which point there was a railroad and telegraph back to Memphis, communication could be had with that part of my command within a few hours by the use of couriers. In case it became necessary to reinforce Corinth, by this arrangement all the troops at Bolivar, except a small guard, could be sent by rail by the way of Jackson in less than twenty-four hours, while the troops from Brownsville could march up to Bolivar to take their place. On the 7th of September I learned of the advance of Van Dorn and Price, apparently upon Corinth. One division was brought from Memphis to Bolivar to meet any emergency that might arise from this move of the enemy. I was much concerned because my first duty, after holding the territory acquired within my command, was to prevent further reinforcing of Bragg in Middle Tennessee. Already the Army of Northern Virginia had defeated the Army under General Pope and was invading Maryland. In the center, General Buell was on his way to Louisville and Bragg, marching parallel to him with a large Confederate force for the Ohio River. I had been constantly called upon to reinforce Buell, until at this time my entire force numbered less than 50,000 men of all arms. This included everything from Cairo south within my jurisdiction. If I, too, should be driven back, the Ohio River would become the line dividing the belligerents west of the Alleghenies, while at the east the line was already further north than when hostilities commenced at the opening of the war. It is true Nashville was never given up after its first capture, but it would have been isolated, and the garrison there would have been obliged to beat a hasty retreat if the troops in West Tennessee had been compelled to fall back. To say at the end of the second year of the war, the line dividing the contestants at the east was pushed north of Maryland, a state that had not seceded, and at the west beyond Kentucky, another state which had been always loyal, would have been discouraging indeed. As it was, Many loyal people despaired in the fall of 1862 of ever saving the Union. The administration at Washington was much concerned for the safety of the cause it held so dear, but I believe there was never a day when the President did not think that, in some way or other, a cause so just as ours would come out triumphant. Up to the 11th of September, Rosecrans still had troops on the railroad east of Corinth, but they had all been ordered in. By the 12th, all were in, except a small force under Colonel Murphy of the 8th Wisconsin. He had been detained to guard the remainder of the stores which had not yet been brought in to Corinth. On the 13th of September, General Sterling Price entered Iuka, a town about twenty miles east of Corinth on the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Colonel Murphy, with a few men, was guarding the place. He made no resistance, 
but evacuated the town on the approach of the enemy. I was apprehensive lest the object of the rebels might be to get troops into Tennessee to reinforce Bragg, as it was afterwards ascertained to be. The authorities at Washington, including the general-in-chief of the army, were very anxious, as I have said, about affairs both in East and Middle Tennessee, and my anxiety was quite as great on their account as for any danger threatening my command. I had not force enough at Corinth to attack Price even by stripping everything, and there was danger that before troops could be got from other points he might be far on his way across the Tennessee. To prevent this, all spare forces at Bolivar and Jackson were ordered to Corinth, and cars were concentrated at Jackson for their transportation. Within twenty-four hours from the transmission of the orders, the troops were at their destination, although there had been a delay of four hours resulting from the forward train getting off the track and stopping all the others. This gave a reinforcement of near 8,000 men, General Ord in command. General Rosecrans commanded the district of Corinth with a movable force of about 9,000 independent of the garrison deemed necessary to be left behind. It was known that General Van Dorn was about four days' march south of us with a large force. It might have been part of his plan to attack at Corinth, Price coming from the east while he came up from the south. My desire was to attack Price before Van Dorn could reach Corinth or go to his relief. General Rosecrans had previously had his headquarters at Iuka, where his command was spread out along the Memphis and Charleston Railroad eastward. While there, he had a most excellent map prepared, showing all the roads and streams in the surrounding country, he was also personally familiar with the ground, so that I deferred very much to him in my plans for the approach. We had cars enough to transport all of General Ord's command, which was to go by rail to Burnsville, a point on the road about seven miles west of Iuka. From there his troops were to march by the north side of the railroad and attack Price from the northwest while Rosecrans was to move eastward from his position south of Corinth by way of the Jacinto Road. A small force was to hold the Jacinto Road, where it turns to the northeast, while the main force moved on the Fulton Road, which comes into Iuka further east. This plan was suggested by Rosecrans. Bear Creek, a few miles to the east of the Fulton Road, is a formidable obstacle to the movement of troops in the absence of bridges, all of which in September 1862 had been destroyed in that vicinity. The Tennessee, to the northeast, not many miles away, was also a formidable obstacle for an army followed by a pursuing force. Ord was on the northwest and even if a rebel movement had been possible in that direction, it could have brought only temporary relief, for it would have carried Price's army to the rear of the national forces and isolated it from all support. It looked to me that, if Price would remain in Iuka until we could get there, his annihilation was inevitable. On the morning of the 18th of September, General Ord moved by rail to Burnsville, and there left the cars and moved out to perform his part of the program. He was to get as near the enemy as possible during the day, and entrench himself so as to hold his position until the next morning. Rosecrans was to be up by the morning of the 19th on the two roads before described, and the attack was to be from all three quarters simultaneously. Troops enough were left at Jacinto and Rienzi to detain any cavalry that Van Dorn might send out 
to make a sudden dash into Corinth until I could be notified. There was a telegraph wire along the railroad, so there would be no delay in communication. I detained cars and locomotives enough at Burnsville to transport the whole of Ord's command at once, and if Van Dorn had moved against Corinth instead of Iuka, I could have thrown in reinforcements to the number of 7,000 or 8,000 before he could have arrived. I remained at Burnsville with a detachment of about 900 men from Ord's command, and communicated with my two wings by courier. Ord met the advance of the enemy soon after leaving Burnsville. Quite a sharp engagement ensued, but he drove the rebels back with considerable loss, including one general officer killed. He maintained his position and was ready to attack by daylight the next morning. I was very much disappointed at receiving a dispatch from Rosecrans after midnight from Jacinto, 22 miles from Iuka, saying that some of his command had been delayed and that the rear of his column was not yet up as far as Jacinto. He said, however, that he would still be at Iuka by two o'clock the next day. I did not believe this possible because of the distance and the condition of the roads, which was bad. Besides, troops, after a forced march of twenty miles, are not in a good condition for fighting the moment they get through. It might do, in marching to relieve a beleaguered garrison, but not to make an assault. I immediately sent Ord, a copy of Rosecrans' dispatch, and ordered him to be in readiness to attack the moment he heard the sound of guns to the south or southeast. He was instructed to notify his officers to be on the alert for any indications of battle. During the 19th, the wind blew in the wrong direction to transmit sound either towards the point where Ord was or to Burnsville, where I had remained. A couple of hours before dark on the 19th, Rosecrans arrived with the head of his column at Garnets, the point where the Jacinto Road to Iuka leaves the road going east. He here turned north without sending any troops to the Fulton Road. While still moving in column up the Jacinto Road, he met a force of the enemy and had his advance badly beaten and driven back upon the main road. In this short engagement, his loss was considerable for the number engaged, and one battery was taken from him. The wind was still blowing hard and in the wrong direction to transmit sounds towards either Ord or me. Neither he nor I nor any one in either command heard a gun that was fired upon the battlefield. After the engagement, Rosecrans sent me a dispatch announcing the result. This was brought by a courier. There was no road between Burnsville and the position then occupied by Rosecrans, and the country was impassable for a man on horseback. The courier, Bearing the message was compelled to move west nearly to Jacinto before he found a road leading to Burnsville. This made it a late hour of the night before I learned of the battle that had taken place during the afternoon. I at once notified Ord of the fact and ordered him to attack early in the morning. The next morning Rosecrans himself renewed the attack and went in to Iuka with but little resistance. Ord also went in according to orders, without hearing a gun from the south of town, but supposing the troops coming from the southwest must be up by that time. Rosecrans, however, had put no troops upon the Fulton Road, and the enemy had taken advantage of this neglect, and retreated by that road during the night. Word was soon brought to me that our troops were in Iuka. I immediately rode into town and found that the enemy was not being pursued even by the cavalry. I ordered pursuit by the whole of Rosecrans' command 
and went on with him a few miles in person. He followed only a few miles after I left him, and then went into camp, and the pursuit was continued no further. I was disappointed at the result of the Battle of Iuka, but I had so high an opinion of General Rosecrans that I found no fault at the time. End of section 28 Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas Jim at joccldv.com